On the 3rd of March, 1703, in Bishopsgate, London, an extraordinary scientist lay dead. His name was Robert Hooke. Hooke's origins were humble, yet his career was meteoric. A search of his rooms found the equivalent of a million pounds in cash. Robert Hooke was the founder of modern experimental science. Described as England's Leonardo, he wrote the first scientific bestseller and was endlessly inventive. Microscopes, watch mechanisms, flying machines, even sash windows were among his hundreds of inventions. He was also the chief surveyor of London, an architect and engineer who worked alongside Sir Christopher Wren. Yet today, almost no one has heard of him. His name has been wiped from the record. 300 years after Hook's death, this film goes in search of a remarkable man and reveals what and who lay behind his destruction. Every major scientist of the day attended Robert Hooke's funeral, except one. Sir Isaac Newton stayed away. It's now clear that these two men had been locked in a bitter rivalry. After Hooke's death, his instruments were broken up and his library sold off. It was also said that Newton ordered the only portrait of Hooke to be destroyed. History itself has completed Newton's revenge. Even Hooke's body has been lost. More than a century ago, thousands of corpses were brought from the city to a desolate overspill cemetery. Hooke's bones were among them. Only recently was it discovered that this mass grave is his final resting place. The last known image of Robert Hooke was at St. Helens in Bishopsgate, where he was originally buried. For Alan Chapman, who's had a lifelong fascination with Hooke, it's a good place to begin an investigation. Yet even here, it seems history is still conspiring against Hooke. In the 19th century, there was a portrait of Robert Hooke done in this church as a stained glass window. It was part of a series of depictions of worthies of the City of London. But tragically, in 1992, an IRA bomb blew that window out. And like so many other things of Robert Hooke, quite simply, even this single memorial was gone. It had long been thought that all Hooke's personal possessions were lost. Then an extraordinary document was discovered by the City of London, Robert Hooke's private diary. It's the only known journal of a 17th century scientist, a vivid insight into Hooke's personality and his restless brilliance. Hooke subjects his life to scientific observation, his social activities and curious sex life, his bizarre health remedies and drug taking. To Sir Christopher Wren's, I showed that Mr. Newton had taken my hypothesis of the pulse or wave. Sir Christopher explained his way thus, showed experiments of microscope, mended skeleton of crocodile, to St. Martin's for geese grease, exceeding good for the piles, at home writing account of weather clock, preparing experiment for the society, pissed as clear as rock water. At the time, people called him a large number of different things. He was 
the Royal Society's curator of experiments. He was the surveyor of the city of London after the great fire. He was a lecturer, he was a professor, he was the greatest mechanic of the age, according to one of his friends. And I think part of the problem about getting Hook right is that we don't have a word anymore that names all the things that Robert Hook did. Hook's portrait may have been destroyed, but his friends have left detailed descriptions. He is but of middling stature, his head is large, his eye full and not quick. He has a delicate head of hair, brown, and of an excellent moist curl. FBI-trained forensic artist Melissa Dring is reconstructing his face. It's not just important to try and stick faithfully to the description of hooked noses and popping eyes or whatever, but to uh, try and imbue the person with some sort of believable character and personality, because that's what makes the person tick. It's a painstaking task, but could produce the best likeness for 300 years. Like Hook's personal possessions, most of the buildings he designed have either been lost or credited to others. By studying the diaries, Alan Chapman has identified one in the centre of London which holds vital secrets about Hook's character and fate. Fifth April, 1676. Pillar at Fish Street Hill. At the top of it saw a balcony, directed about setting the urn. This is the monument to the Great Fire of London of 1666. It was built just 202 feet from where the fire began. But on the board it says, this monument, designed by Sir Christopher Wren. What it fails to mention is Robert Hooke, who was surveyor to the city of London and also played a significant part in the construction of this building. Robert Hooke was not an assistant. He was not a man who came along and just carried the tool bags for a greater figure. Alan is exploring a little known chamber underneath the building. It reveals that this is also a monument to Hooke's scientific imagination. He designed the structure to have an additional surprising purpose. This building was an enormously long telescope. The intention was to have a lens 202 feet up in the air and fixed on a frame and a pair of threads hanging an eyepiece down to what would have been about here. And Hooke would then have lain on a couch with his eye to the eyepiece and you would have seen literally into the zenith. And the intention was to observe a particular star, Gamma Draconis, as astronomers call it, a star with the Greek letter Gamma in the constellation of Draco the Dragon. Unpicking the secrets of the universe was the greatest aim of 17th century astronomers. No one then had any idea of its size. Hooke aimed to solve the puzzle by measuring the distance of the stars from the Earth. And he wanted to see if Gamma Draconis and observed from the bottom of this monument had a slight shift over a six month period. Because if he could see that and you could measure it, you could measure the distance of Gamma Draconis. Hooke's monument, built at the pinnacle of his career, captures the vibrancy and energy of the man. But what drove him to create such remarkable inventions? Vital clues could lie here at Hook's birthplace on the Isle of Wight, an island besieged by the elements. Robert Hook, son of John Hook, sometime curate of Freshwater in the Isle of Wight was born there in July and baptised the 19th of the same month, anno 1635. The Hook family house has now gone, 
but the setting of Robert's childhood is much as it was. His father hoped he might follow him into the church, but the young Hook's imagination is now captured by nature. Around him, he sees the rolling of the sea and the spectacular dappled light. Through the next 50 years of his life as a scientist, he will return to light and gravity, energy and motion, the elemental forces of nature. Hooke's unique genius will be to break into these forces by means of mechanical devices. On the island, he shows early indications of his talent. He made a small ship about a yard long, fitly shaping it, adding its rigging of ropes, pulleys, masts, etc., with a contrivance to make it fire off some small guns as it was sailing across a haven of a pretty breadth. And being from his childhood, ingeniously given, ingeniously given, the hallmark of Robert Hooke. Ingenious, ingenuity. It's a wonderful word to think with if you're trying to think about Robert Hooke, because on the one hand, it resonates with the word engine. Right, that's where it comes from. So that ingenuity speaks to the capacity to make and manipulate machines engines. On the other hand, it also captures a notion of genius, of intellect, and of intelligence. It attributes to the manipulation of machinery virtues which up till then had typically been attributed to the life of the mind. The Isle of Wight can't satisfy a boy as ambitious as Robert Hooke. He goes to London and spends his meagre inheritance on fees for Westminster School. He's taken under the wing of the headmaster, Dr. Busby, and we know from Hooke's biographer that he excels at music and geometry. He learned to play 20 lessons on the organ. He there, in one week's time, made himself master of the first six books of Euclid, to the admiration of Dr. Busby. He was very mechanical, and amongst other things, he invented 30 several ways of flying. But Hook wasn't a typical Westminster boy. Young gentlemen didn't usually spend their time inventing things. His poverty also marked him out, and when he continued his studies at Oxford, he had to work as a servant for wealthier students. Hook's shortage of funds dogged him for years. To make ends meet, he earned money singing in the cathedral choir. For Robert Hooke, music was more than a source of income. It came to inspire much of his approach to science. Like architecture, music was built on ratio and balance. But vibration seemed to be the key to his notion of the cosmos. It mattered both for music and as a metaphor for the other forces that fascinated him. Hooke well understood that sound travels through the air as a series of vibrations. He understood the law of harmonies and the octave so that different weights on strings corresponded to an orderly mathematical progression of different notes. And these beautiful musical harmonies, he reckoned, captured something absolutely fundamental about God's plan for the world. God is, after all, the great architect, and he's made an architecturally harmonious, musical, vibrating cosmos. Hook's passion is to understand the basic forces of nature. 
he now becomes a paid assistant to a radical group of gentlemen philosophers also based in Oxford. This is the birth of experimental science. This is where the Oxford Philosophical Club met, of which Robert Hooke was a member. He would have met Dr. Wilkins and other illustrious fellows in this hall. People like Sir Christopher Wren, Robert Boyle, Thomas Willis, and here they would have discussed the weight of the atmosphere, the moons of Jupiter, and perhaps exactly how you could test that the blood circulated around the body of living creatures. The new philosophers believed in finding things out by means of experiment. Instead of merely contemplating the world, they wanted to interfere with it. What was new for groups of English intellectuals in the 17th century was that rather than study nature as it normally is, you study nature in special, odd, particular, strange circumstances. As the patron of the new philosophy, Francis Bacon, put it, you must put nature to the question. To do that, the gentlemen philosophers needed Hooke's mechanical expertise. They used to frequent this local coffee house, the first in England. It was probably here that Hooke met the man who was to be his lifelong friend and patron. The Honourable Robert Boyle was fascinated with one particular element in nature, the air. With Hooke's assistance, he could now put it to the question. Boyle wanted to experiment with what happened when you had a vacuum. What happened to flames and to living creatures inside a vacuum? But he couldn't find anyone who could build him an appropriate pumping machine. And Robert Hooke designed one for him. This was big science. The air pump was the particle accelerator of its day. The first expensive piece of kit built for making experiments. If Hooke could get it to work, it would be his passport to success. First, he wanted a large glass bowl in which the vacuum would be created. For London's glass blowers, it was a considerable challenge. He needed a smooth cylinder with a piston to suck out the air. For that, he went to London's gun makers, the only people with the skills for precision metal work. He also needed joiners to build the frame and clockmakers to cut the gears that operated the pump. What Hooke had contrived was a remarkable means to investigate the nature of air. Rather a good way of finding out what's special about the air is to produce a space in which there isn't any. And this is surely one of the great strengths of the experimental project of the time. If you want to know what's special about something, get rid of it and see what happens. Early experiments examined the effects of a vacuum. A flattened sheep's bladder was put inside and the surrounding air sucked out. Boyle and Hooke's argument was that if you removed the ambient air from around a bladder originally, or in modern case, of course, a balloon, and there were only a few what he would have considered as atoms in the air of air inside that balloon, their expansive rate was so great they would literally fill into the space around them. That the air is what Boyle called elastic. Boyle claimed that it took about three minutes to get a vacuum. Of course, you're fulfilling the realm idol, what Boyle refers to as our pumper, who was the man clearly who did the work of operating the machine. 
You wouldn't talk to the pumper anyway. Probably not. We'd give him a kick if you'd have got it wrong. <laughs> it's beginning to go larger, isn't it? As the vacuum developed, the pressure difference between inside and out became enormous. Maintaining a tight seal was tricky. Oh, bugger, we've broken the seal! <laughs> Sorry. The air pump shed light on a 30-year-old problem. What our lungs take from the air was still a mystery. And although William Harvey had shown that blood circulates round the body, no one was sure why. The reason seems to be so that it can be mixed with something in the lungs. That meant that it was an important research question, a question of life and death, literally, to find out what it is in the air which goes into the blood. For Hooke, it was to become a life and death question, when years later he used a bigger air pump to experiment on himself. The air pump was a scientific landmark, a machine for producing new facts about nature. It showed that a mechanical device could be used to solve philosophical problems. That was a very controversial claim. Lots of people denied it. But what was fascinating was that what had been a set of philosophical puzzles were turned into a set of machine puzzles to be resolved by experiments and counter-experiments. At Boyle's laboratory in Oxford, Robert Hooke's work with the air pump launched a career that would shape modern science. This plaque commemorates his achievement. In the other great university town of Cambridge, meanwhile, a young man of similar background was beginning his studies. Isaac Newton also shared many of Hooke's interests and personal characteristics. But unlike Hooke, he was a mathematician of genius. It would be a fateful distinction. Charles II had just been restored to the throne following the collapse of Cromwell's regime. This political convulsion would indirectly benefit Robert Hooke. The Oxford gentlemen were attracted back to London, where they set themselves up as the Royal Society to promote the new science. They'd hoped for money from King Charles, but had to settle for a royal charter. We're in the archive room of the Royal Society, underground, in their iron-locked vault, the safest place in the Royal Society, and it needs to be. This chamber contains some of the most valuable books in the Society's history, including the one I have in front of me now. It records all the appointments and all the original establishment of the Society. This volume is 350 years old. One of the most remarkable things in it, from 1662, is the appointment of Robert Hooke, and it says this. Sir Robert Moray proposed a person willing to be entertained as the curator of the society and offering to furnish them every day that they meet with three or four considerable experiments, Mr Hooke being named to be the person. Hooke was soon in charge of the Royal Society's entire experimental programme. He'd become the first professional research scientist in history, yet he was still a servant. It was his job to produce demonstrations. If he didn't produce demonstrations, he was in trouble with his bosses. So there was a certain prosaic uh, pressure on him uh, week by week to provide some entertainment, as it might be called, for the, for the society. Hooke's experiments ranged over the entire field of science. And in performing for the society's fellows, he could develop his theories of light, vibration and gravity experiment of air in the bladder. At home, writing account of weather clock, preparing experiment for the society. Told the society of arithmetical engine. Tried the experiment of fire 
by the help of burning glass and found air decrease. I understand that beneath this cover is the very table on which British science was established. On this table, Hooke would have demonstrated his microscope, probably his physiological examinations, certainly his early work on springs and watches, and around it would have been set all the fellows. And this was the table on which it all began. Hooke's demonstrations were, went beyond the, the, the occasion of the, of the meeting. They had an explanatory content. He felt that it's only through uh, manipulation of instruments and, and, and apparatus and models and making demonstrations with them that we would come to understand the natural world more, more fully. Because he felt that they, he believed that the natural world was a great machine and his natural philosophy therefore was mechanical as well. Now, central to this idea of the universe as a mechanism is vibration. Whether it's the nature of light, or sound, or gravitation, or magnetism, or anything, he sees the great primal forces of nature as all caused by shocks passing through the medium. And this, I think, is the one great centralizing thing in Hooke's thought. Bishopsgate in the city of London. The Royal Society's first home was on the space now occupied by this office tower. The Society told Hooke to move in so that he could prepare his experiments on site. For the rest of his life, he lived in an apartment in one corner of the courtyard. It became a hotbed of discovery and invention. He would get up in the morning, normally rather early, normally after a really bad sleep. He was always ill or moaning or both, and work all morning on schemes, projects, models, calculations, write his lectures, prepare experiments for the Royal Society. Hooke's diary shows how he experiments on everything, including himself. He's working so hard he gets ill, so doses himself relentlessly with quack remedies and drugs. I took spirit of urine and laudanum with milk for the three preceding nights. The diary reveals that Hook's female servants are often his sexual partners. Played with Nell, hurt small of back. He records his orgasms using the symbol for Pisces. Even then, he can't sleep. As a chronic insomniac, Hook's often up late, peering at the heavens through a telescope in his attic. Went not to bed. Observed strange inequality in the reflective properties of the moon. Astronomy was the heart of the new science. Hooke believed that better lenses could reveal the secrets of the cosmos, and he experimented ceaselessly with ways of making a shorter telescope. It's just a mirror concave in the middle and a mirror acting like a lens. So it's working by a focused reflection on the basis of the reflecting telescope. And Hooke spent about five years trying to develop this technology. It's so beautiful and so simple. Hooke wanted to explore the minutiae of life and using his revolutionary microscope began to open up the structure of the world about him. Telescopes, microscopes and air pumps are the basic tools of experimental science and Hooke either invented or improved them all. By enhancing our perception, these devices could crack open nature. The young Hooke spent a decade opening up the secrets of the world. It culminated in his great book, Micrographia, published in 1665. Nobody had ever seen anything like these images. The Earth itself which lies so near us, under our feet, shows quite a new thing to us, and in every particle of its matter, we now behold almost as great a variety of creatures as we were able before to reckon up in the whole universe.
This was a media event. It's probably the greatest manifesto of the 1660s. It shows you the excitement, the vivacity, the energy that drives the new philosophy in Restoration London in a way that is perhaps more graphic, literally, than any other work that he produces. When Micrographia was published, people did rush to the shops to buy a copy. They made sure to try and get a microscope so they could see what Robert Hooke had seen. He'd seen man-made objects such as the tip of a needle or the edge of a razor blade. He compared their magnified imperfections with the beauty he found in nature, even in the mold growing on a leather book cover. Hooke's masterpiece now brought him to the attention of an unknown young Cambridge graduate. Isaac Newton made copious notes on micrographia. Hooke had written that light is made up of waves. In reaction, Newton set to work on his own theory that it's made up of particles. This was the beginning of a conflict that would eventually bring about Hooke's demise. It would also lead to a profound change in science, once Newton's mathematical approach became the ideal. But the two men's paths wouldn't cross for another seven years. While Newton could concentrate in the solitude of his study, Hooke was handicapped by his employer's endless demands. He was also distracted by a hectic social life centered on a thriving new institution. Pipes, boy. Anyway, I was thinking of The coffee house was one of the great inventions of the 17th century. Places like Garraway's and Jonathan's and Mann's formed Robert Hooke's second home. There he met his friends, lawyers, doctors, country gentlemen, fellows of the Royal Society. There they discussed the great issues of the day. And it's in Robert Hooke's diary, which records in coffee houses, first showing his spring balance for watches, describing his work on telescopes, experiments in medicine, and a whole myriad of new scientific discoveries in this wonderful new free and easy social milieu. Anybody could go to a coffee house, provided they were male. For the first time, there was a place where Hook could meet his instrument makers and craftsmen, as well as more genteel friends and clients. Coffee houses are relatively egalitarian, new inst institutions, the cyber caps of the scientific revolution. Robert Hook, hypochondriac, got rather interested in whether coffee, which was pricey, or chocolate, which was very pricey, were better for the various things that were ailing him. And in his diary, he, re he records not merely which coffee houses he went to, but exactly how he felt after drinking them. Galloway's home. I found that there was something in my head that shut or opened as soon as ever I fell asleep. I dreamt several things that came to pass the day following. One of the most arresting images in micrographia was the flea, the very organism which that year would bring plague to London. And within months, most of the city would be destroyed in the Great Fire. Not only does Hook survive these twin calamities, he finally makes his fortune in a totally unexpected way. With his old friend Christopher Wren, he embarks on the rebuilding of London. Hook works on the Dome of St Paul's, which the two men plan to use as a giant scientific instrument like their other collaboration, the Monument. Hook's recording its ascent in his diary at the pillar on Fish Street Hill. It was above ground, 210 steps.
this is absolutely superb. To stand here and see the city as Hook would have known it, at least in its ground plan. Because after the Great Fire of 1666, all the attempts to rebuild the city in a fancy new design all fell through. And of course, one of the reasons for that is because London was a rich city. It didn't have time to sit around being replanned. Its aldermen and its merchants and its men of business wanted to get the tills rattling again as quickly as possible, which meant that the surveyors had to start building on the known streets. And this has gone on ever since. Hook was appointed city surveyor. He had no previous experience and the pressure was immense. 80% of the city had been destroyed and the owners were desperate to rebuild. But they couldn't get started until Hook's team had surveyed their properties. This is one of the streets that Hook staked out immediately after the fire. And Hook staked out the line of the streets down one side and down the other. The stakes were placed 14 feet apart, which was the new regulated width for streets of this kind. It meets Cannon Street at the north, and that was a major street which was staked out to 40 feet. If this wasn't intellectually demanding, it was certainly lucrative. A property owner losing land could get compensation only with one of these certificates. Hook was paid for each one he signed, and there were thousands of them. Insofar as he staked out about 15 or 20 miles of London Street, largely on the old alignments, although of course there are some new ones, then the present form of London was largely the one that was staked out by Hook. It's an astonishing achievement. Having surveyed London, Hook starts rebuilding it. He designs dozens of public buildings, almost all of which have now disappeared. The biggest is the Bethlehem Hospital for Lunatics, better known as Bedlam, which stood in what's now Finsbury Circus. Christopher Wren is traditionally credited with rebuilding London's city churches. But Alan Chapman's convinced that Robert Hooke is the real author of a number of the buildings wrongly ascribed to Wren. A comparison with one of the few surviving Hook buildings, the church at Willen in Buckinghamshire, reveals striking similarities. What does Willen Parish Church tell us about Robert Hook? Well, for one thing, it gives us some insight into the buildings he may have made in London. He'd absorbed the major elements of the prevailing and fashionable Dutch style, the wonderful use of red brick, faced with limestone. But also, he was a master of the decorative style of antiquity. Hook's style is epitomised in one of his most admired buildings, the Royal College of Physicians. This is how it would have looked in the late 17th century. It stood just round the corner from St Paul's, then under construction. Tragically, Hook's creation burnt down during the 19th century. But Alan Chapman's found a section that miraculously has survived. This is the panelled room at the Royal College of Physicians. It's now in Regent's Park. It's magnificent panelling, it's fluted pilasters as they're called, the decorative Corinthian motifs at the top, and a chandelier still similar to the one today. Paintings to mark the leading physicians of the age. One over here of Thomas Sydenham, who would have been a contemporary of Robert Hooke's. Hooke would have known lots of spaces like this in 17th century London, both before and after the fire. His own rooms in Gresham College would have been a little bit like this. Grand ceremonial chambers, panelled with wood to keep them warm. This would have been the ambience to which learned men would have come and met, would have discussed, done their business, smoked their pipes, quarrelled, 
and practiced medicine. Hook's octagonal dissecting theatre became one of the sights of London. It was even depicted in a celebrated Hogarth cartoon. The physicians' activities were public knowledge, and their bizarre experiments made them an easy target for satirists, as Hook was about to find out. At the coffee house one evening with his friends, he heard of a new play. It was all about a scientist whose work sounded alarmingly familiar. But now to return to my transfusion. That was a rare experiment of transfusing the blood of a sheep into a madman. A short of many of mine. I assure you I have transfused into a human vein 64 ounces of what you poor weight of one sheep. The emittent sheep died under the operation, but the recipient madman is still alive. He suffered some disorder at first, the sheep's blood being heterogeneous, but in a short time it became homogeneous with his own. Ah, gentlemen, is this not incomparable? But you shall hear more. The patient, from being maniacal or raging mad, became wholly ovine or sheepish. He bleated perpetually and chewed the cud. He had wool growing on him in vast quantities, and a Northamptonshire sheep's tail did soon arise or emerge from his anus or human fundament. That happened. There was a guy from Cambridge called Arthur Coger, and in the middle of the 1660s, Robert Hooke and his friends really got a group of sheep and transfused blood from the sheep into Coger after filling him with booze and he survived. Shadwell's Ribbit. play lampooned many Ribbit. of the activities of the new scientists, but Hook was singled out for special treatment. Ah, well struck, Sir Nicholas. That was admirable. That was as well swum as any man in England can. This is satire which has great actuality. Right? One is to expect the audience at least the audience in 1676, to get all the in-jokes, right? This is Have I Got News For You, except it's about science. Have you ever tried in the water, sir? No, sir, but I swim most exquisitely on land. Do you intend to practice in the water, sir? Never, sir. I hate the water. I never come upon the water, sir. That would have enraged them the most. For Hook and his friends, that was a nauseatingly inaccurate ca characterization of what they were doing. With Godfrey and Tompion at play. Damn dogs. God help me. People almost pointed. Hook was embarrassed, but the satire was a tribute to his celebrity. Highly regarded as a scientist, he was making money from his architecture and cutting a figure in society. He was enjoying a brief period of happiness with his young niece, Grace, who'd arrived from the Isle of Wight. 25 years Hooks Jr., she was now living as his common-law wife. Hook recorded their sex life in his usual way. Grace, perfectly, intimately, entirely, slept well. Even at the height of his fame, Robert Hooke was fiercely protective of his achievements. But he was unlucky enough to clash with the unusually neurotic character of Isaac Newton. In 1671, after years of relentless and isolated labor, Newton was about to enter the stage of European science. Though he was primarily a mathematician, Newton's first challenge to Robert Hooke was on his home ground, because Newton had come up with a revolutionary new reflecting telescope. He sent it to the Royal Society, where it caused a sensation. At this stage, Robert Hooke had no idea who Isaac Newton was. He was a Cambridge professor, recently appointed, who'd di who was trespassing on Robert Hooke's turf. Robert Hooke was the man in London who designed machines like this. So this was a challenge. 
to Hooke's expertise. And then a few months later, a letter reaches London from Newton giving the experiments which he's used to demonstrate the new theory of light and colour on which this telescope design is based. Newton's paper showed how he'd realised that white light isn't pure, as Hooke had thought, but a mixture of the different colours of the spectrum. We now know that Newton was right, but at the time Hooke disagreed, and his dismissive reaction would cost him dear. It stimulated Newton to yet greater work on optics, which he refused to publish until after Hooke's death. Hooke's interactions with Newton depended on Henry Oldenburg, who controlled the correspondence of the Royal Society. Hooke therefore made a bad mistake in falling foul of Oldenburg over the struggle for a lucrative royal patent. It would be 50 years before longitude could be accurately measured, but Robert Hooke was already sketching ideas for timekeeping at sea. He'd come up with the notion that the back and forth movement of a spring could give an even beat to a watch mechanism. But typically, he'd been too busy ever to perfect it. The Dutchman Christian Huygens had had the same idea. He promised Oldenburg the valuable English rights to the watch if he secured a patent from the king. Hooke promptly accused Oldenburg of stealing his invention and conspiring with Huygens to profit from it. His balanced spring idea harked right back to his earliest interests in vibration and movement. He codified this property in his famous law, which is still taught at his old school. So I want to repeat, if I can, the experiment with the vertical spring and observe the extensions within the spring. I read my theory of springs and showed the experiments to illustrate it. All were well pleased. Hooke's law is really not just a technical solution to a problem of how to make springs work in clocks. It's a cosmic truth. It explains how the whole of the universe can be understood as a series of mechanical vibrations. And in that sense, Hooke offers us a musical science, a science which represents creation as in constant harmony with itself. But there was little harmony between Hooke and Oldenburg, whose integrity he'd so publicly doubted. Such behaviour reminded the Royal Society that Hooke wasn't really a gentleman. It would also inflame his relations with Newton. As secretary, Oldenburg began to misrepresent Hooke, who suspected as much. A letter also of Mr. Newton's seeming to quarrel from Oldenburg's false suggestions. Hooke now tried to limit the damage. He acknowledged the younger man's contribution on light and colour. I believe the subject cannot meet with a fitter and more able person to inquire into it than yourself, who are in every way fitted to complete, rectify and reform what were the sentiments of my younger studies. Newton's double-edged reply has become legendary. If I have seen farther, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Was this really generous recognition of Hook? It could equally be a cruel jibe at his short stature. The two men's attempts at courtesy failed to disguise the real venom between them. And there was much worse to come. Newton's theory of gravity was perhaps his greatest achievement and underlay the final clash with Hooke. The workings of this fundamental force were a challenge to Europe's finest intellects and a lifelong research interest of Hooke's. He now had the monument as a platform for experiments on gravity. At the top, he suspended a balance and weighed an object. Then he lowered it to ground level and weighed it again. He expected the weight to increase very slightly as it approached the Earth because of the greater gravitational pull. His theory was correct, 
but the balances of the time were too crude to detect the tiny discrepancy. Hooke thought that the same gravitational force might also be responsible for the movement of the planets. His friend, Wren, had designed the Royal Observatory and Hooke equipped it with state-of-the-art instruments. Their accuracy supplied the increasingly precise observations needed for astronomy to progress. It's here that Alan Chapman's found the one genuine fragment of a Hook telescope. I understand that this is the nearest thing we have to surviving part of a telescope by Hooke. That's right, it's the, it's the earliest English transit instrument, and it's the, it's the only instrument we can really attach Hooke's name to with any sense of reality. I understand at least the optics are, I, are I think, the nearest I think thing the, the optics are probably the, the connection to Hooke. So it really is quite a beautiful piece of work. Yes. And so here, really, I suppose we have one of the only connections with Robert Hooke, a direct connection, at least through these lenses, Robert Hooke's eyes once beheld the heavens. Hooke's use of such instruments led him to make an imaginative leap concerning planetary motion. He said that the Earth's motion is made up of two components, movement in a straight line and attraction towards the sun. So the Earth is drawn into a curved orbit around the Sun. Having succeeded Oldenburg as secretary, he told Isaac Newton about his breakthrough. I shall take it as a great favour if you will let me know your thoughts of compounding the celestial motions of the planets. The one man capable of assessing Hooke's idea now claimed that science no longer interested him. However, he was intrigued enough to suggest a description of the line of a falling body. But Newton had got it wrong, and when Hooke told him so, he was furious. He was even angrier to learn that Hooke had exposed his error to the Royal Society. Publicising such correspondence was one of Hooke's duties as secretary, but doubtless it was sweetened by the memory of his earlier clash with Newton. Unaware of Newton's rising fury, Hooke wrote again and revealed, almost in passing, that he'd guessed the law of gravitation, that the force attracting two bodies varies as the inverse square of the distance between them. Newton never bothered to reply, but Hooke had again provoked his greatest work. He'd also thought of the inverse square law and now set about the far harder task of proving it. For six years, he toiled on his masterpiece, the Principia Mathematica, in which he showed that the solar system could be completely described using a law of universal gravity. This is unbelievable. Newton gives no mechanism for gravity. He doesn't explain what causes it. And he's designed this magnificent system from Hooke's point of view, purely on the basis of a small group of astronomical observations and a great deal of abstract geometrical analysis. Whereas Hooke has studied the Earth, he's studied the planets, he's the master of telescopic astronomy, no one is better than him in London at that science, and he's built machines which mimic the system of the world. But Hooke had never had a reply to his suggestion of the inverse square law. Fatally, he accused Newton of plagiarism. He drew up a list of all the things in Newton's Principia which Newton borrowed from him. And when this list reached Newton, he exploded. As a mathematician, Hooke wasn't in the same league, and Newton knew it. He was enraged by the charge of plagiarism, and the Royal Society sided with him. Hooke was publicly humiliated. I think Hooke never recovered and never forgave Isaac Newton for his treatment. He becomes more morose, more withdrawn, less sociable than he had been when younger. And his relationship with almost all of the fellows of the Royal Society, whom he began to see as ganging up on him as a Newtonian conspiracy indeed, becomes really intolerable. So at the personal and the research levels, the 
treatment by Newton as he saw it, a treatment he never forgave and never forgot, uh, really changed his life. 1687 was a terrible year for Robert Hooke. His misery was sealed when Grace died, aged only 26. In later years, weakened by numberless quack remedies, his health deteriorated sharply. Hooke's first biographer described him in old age. He was always very pale and lean, and latterly nothing but skin and bone with a meagre aspect. His eyes grey and full, with a sharp, ingenious look. He's sitting in a cold room, so his nose is a little red. It's a thinker's face, though, and he's... Uh, he's suffered quite a lot. He's had a lot of ill health, but he's also had outrageous disadvantages put upon him. I felt, what a wonderful member of the human race. A fantastic man. I'd have loved to have met him. Hook, in his last year, was ill, melancholy, bedridden and blind. He died on the 3rd of March, 1703, and was buried with grace at nearby St. Helens. An inventory listed Hook's possessions and library. It also showed that he'd spent little of the money he'd worked so hard to make. In his room was more than £8,000 in cash, the equivalent today of a million. It seems that Hook had hesitated to leave it to the Royal Society, which had fallen so fully under the sway of his rival. Newton now became its president and ruled unchallenged over British science. What Newton and his allies very successfully did in the final years of Hooke's lifetime, and then in the two decades after Hooke's death, was to remove him from the official history of the Royal Society and from the history of cosmology and natural philosophy. Newton's victory over Hooke was far more than personal. It was the triumph of an entire view of the universe based on the unifying power of mathematics. Robert Hooke, architect, experimentalist and inventor, was written out of the story of science. Yet today's world owes him much. Hooke's confidence in the practical value of science and his enduring stamp on London are both symbolised here. He may have been robbed of the credit, but it's still a monument to a genius. Warfare gets biological next tonight on BBC Four with tonight's movie. Brad Pitt and Bruce Willis star in Terry Gilliam's scientific thriller, 12 Monkeys, next. <laughs>